Hello there, my name is Pastor Buck Wilford. I'm the pastor here at Brunswick Community Church. We're located right in the Rito's Bakery Plaza at 1930 Pearl Road. We have church at 10 a.m. on Sundays and Bible study at 6.30 p.m. on Thursdays. We also have good Christian education hour at 9 a.m. Sundays if you want to come a little early. We're a church that loves people and we love God. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to uh, meet you. We'd love to just be a part of your life as well, too. We're focused in on preaching the Bible. I do it verse by verse, expository style. We hold to the five solas. We believe strongly that we're saved only by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it's all to the glory of God alone. And the only thing we hold as infallible and inerrant and strongly adhere to is the scriptures alone. We'd love to see you out here. We'd love to have you come visit. Thank you so much. talks about money so we're talking about money a little bit today too and I got a picture of a fellow with money in one hand got some hundreds it looks like and the Bible uh, in the other hand right there and I've looked at pictures a lot of pictures like have a guy looking at the Bible or something but I think the passage better relates to a fellow that's in between that stands both in the world of wealth and in his faith and that's not a good place to be it's where the Pharisees were, and it's what Jesus really uh, hits them with. I tell you, Jesus is a hard hitter. There's no uh, pacificity with Jesus. He's talking to Pharisees now for a while, and he's hitting them hard. And he's hitting them, like, really hard. It's hurting them. And this is like a sin that they had. They were all about trying to be as wealthy and fine off in the world as they could and still act like they were right with God and faith as well at the same time. And they weren't. They were terrible with the faith, and Jesus is letting them know you can't have, you can't, you can't stand in both places. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven, and think that that's a good thing. And uh, it's a really good passage. What we're really going to see through this passage is grace. So at times when it may seem too overwhelming to you, just praise God that you're saved by grace and not by works. Because they were people, the Pharisees, that believed in uh, being saved by works, and there is the law. And there is the truth of God's word, and we should be obedient, and we should follow it with everything we have. But thank God we're not going to heaven because of that, because none of us would make it. We'd all fall short, what the Bible says, and we know it ourselves too, if you're honest with yourself. But here I wrote in here, in chapter 15, it dealt with wrong attitudes toward people, all right? Because we had the, the, the poor woman that lost the coin, we had the... The, the sheep that went out was lost, you know, was talking about Jesus eating with sinners and stuff, and he was telling them these things about the sheep that was lost and how the shepherd goes after, leaves the 99, goes after the one to bring him home. The shepherd doesn't lose one of the sheep. And it talked about the prodigal son and also the elder son, who was like the Pharisee that stood outside. So it was talking about attitudes toward people there. But now we're going to talk about attitudes toward possessions, all right? So often possessions can actually possess people. We're driven by a possession, by like a piece of wood, a piece of money, something like this, rather than something that's real, like God himself. And uh, and, it, and I wrote here that if, if those things, if those possessions possess us, if they master us, okay? If we don't master our money by using it for the glory of God, then it will master us. And we'll end up bankrupt for eternity. And that's not to say, we got to be clear here, we got to understand, okay? We should be good stewards with our money. We should be giving to God. That's absolutely certain. There's no doubt about it. It's all throughout the word of God. Money should not own us. God should own us. All things belong to God should be our understanding. But we also don't believe in a workspace system where because you fall short, you're not going to end up in heaven. 
okay? But on the same token, that doesn't give us the, 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 the okay to go and just continue to sin and to break God's law and do things against God, okay? So it's an area of maturity, maturity for sure here in this subject right here that we're going to hit in this passage. So he says, now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a steward, and this steward was reported to him as squandering his possessions. So Jesus is giving a parable about this steward, and the steward got reported for squandering the possessions. So we know it's going to happen. He's going to get fired because he was squandering the possessions and uh, not doing the right job. And uh, so that's how Jesus introduces the story. And these guys would have connected very well to this because these guys were very rich. Pharisees were rich. It's even there's a verse in here that says the Pharisees were very rich. Okay, they were well off type of folks. They were like the way it is. I've seen it myself as a pastor. I told people before I don't get paid as a pastor. And when I tell some people that, they think, well, I'm not really a pastor. I'm not a professional because I don't get paid. Because a professional, or somebody that's really good at what they do, they get paid and they're well off. And sometimes those guys on TV will flaunt that kind of stuff. And they'll show just how rich they are, like trying to show. I, I've even seen local churches, big one in Strongsville, don't want to say the name of it, where the only thing I heard when I turned on their website was how big their church was, how wealthy their church was, how many people their church had. And I heard absolutely nothing about the gospel whatsoever. And I think that's a worldly way to judge uh, wealth. That's a worldly way to judge success. And it's not a godly way. And even though today's times you think are so much far removed from the Bible times, it's not really so far removed because we're still human beings. We've still got the sin nature. And we still get so stuck in this world looking at self and looking at stuff and materialism rather than looking at God. And uh, so... So Jesus is talking to a bunch of rich men, and he's talking about this rich steward, okay, a rich man who had a steward, like a slave, a worker, and uh, the worker was, was wasting his stuff, and we're going to see what happens. And he called for him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. So he's, he's, he says, tell me everything that's going on, you're losing your job, you're done, you're through it. And think about this. This was this man's livelihood. This was his career. This was his job. This was everything he had. All right? This is a lot of pressure on this fellow. There's something that's strange about this passage is a lot of people have a hard time looking at this passage because Jesus is going to give us a picture-perfect way of how a corrupt world does corrupt things to come out on top. That's what he's going to give us a picture of, okay? Don't think that you should be like this steward, okay? This steward is not your example, all right? He's going he's gonna to hit him hard here. Just wait with me. Don't let me lose you before I let you see where he hits him hard. Don't think, well, I'll be like, I should be like that steward. No, he's, he's giving them an example into their rich Pharisee man, false religion type of world, religion on the outside, not religion on the inside. And then he's going to come in and do the uppercut, knock these guys down flat on the butt right here, okay? So don't let me get you uh, messed up here. And the steward said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. Man, I can see this perfectly. If I were to lose everything I had, man, I'm starting to get a little bit older. I know some folks here think you're a young young whippersnapper, but you're only 50. But that, you make me feel good when you guys think that. I know some of you think that. But when I was a young guy, I sure didn't think 50 was young enough. I'm getting to be 50. I wouldn't want to have to have a job where I dug all day long. I wouldn't want to be a laborer, okay? I remember when I was a young guy, I was a construction worker for a bricklayer, carrying giant 12-inch blocks, sometimes solid 12-inch block, running, building basements, helping those guys, uh, carrying the mud hod, making the mortar, all this heavy-duty stuff. And I come home just exhausted. I couldn't imagine doing that now at my age. I'd be in bad shape, okay? I think about the Army. I think about basic training. I think about... Ranger school, special forces school. I think when I make those things again, maybe basic, but I don't know about the rest of them right there. I'd have a hard time going back through this stuff, you know? And I could see, think about this guy. He's like, I'm not strong enough to dig anymore. I'm not strong enough to go that route, okay? Maybe he's a middle-aged type guy or something. Maybe he's a guy like my age, a little bit older. I don't know. And yet he's ashamed to beg. He doesn't want to be the guy on the corner begging with a hat saying, please, 
Give me a couple coins. Please give me a couple dollars right here so that I can live. So we, we, can, we can relate to this guy and we can understand it for sure. Okay, there's no doubt about this, about this unrighteous steward. He says, I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, people will take me into their homes. So he war gained a plan, a plan of survival, a plan that he would be able to keep on keeping on, that he wouldn't have to dig and he wouldn't have to beg. Okay, so now he's going to do some shady stuff that's going to be recognized as a, as a wonderful type of deed in a shady world. That's what he's about to do. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? So he's getting these guys together. We're going to see two examples, but likely there was probably a whole bunch of fellas that he went after. Okay, It wasn't just two and the story was over with. This, Jesus gave two examples here. And he says, How much do you owe my master? And he said, 100 baths of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. So he gave him a heck of a deal, 50% off. Like, you have all this debt, I'm going to give you 50% off. Here, sign it right away. Sign it right now. Isn't this the way it is if you were to use car place, even a regular car place, anywhere? They're like, quick, sign the dotted line. Just sign it right here. Go on and sign. Whenever we have somebody wants us to sign real fast, it's an automatic warning in every one of us. It should be like, there's something that could be wrong here. Wait, let me read the fine print. Let me see the writing, right? But he tells him, quick, quick, just write it down. Now, how much was 100 baths of oil? This was like 1,000 gallons of oil. That's what that was. I don't know if your little study Bibles or something would say that, but from what I studied, it said 1,000 gallons of oil. Now, that was a lot. That was about enough for them to heat their home for the entire year, to cook with, to heat, to do everything that they did. So you think about 50% off on your heating bill for a whole year that you owe? Great deal right there. You make it work right there, right? So they pay the money. And this still goes on today. Some people in bad credit card debt, if they're down real heavy, and the credit card people know that they're lucky to get anything from this person, you can make a deal with them and they'll give you half off and stuff. I've seen it myself before, okay? But this is what goes on, and he says, go ahead and just write 50. And he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, 100 cores of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. Okay, so he's the throw it out, gave him 80. Maybe this guy looked like he had a little bit more wealth. So he's like, hey, don't have to take a 50% discount. This guy just gets a 20% discount. And he gave this to him. And this is, once again, like a year's worth of food. It's what 100 cores of wheat would have been, all right? I think it's been like the 55-gallon drum type of thing for wheat. And uh, I guess they ate a lot of wheat <laughs> back then, all right? They did a lot of cooking with wheat with a lot of bread and stuff. But here, this is what goes on. And we're seeing how this guy is doing this. Now, why is he doing this? He's doing this, remember, because he's losing his job and he's hoping to make good with other people. So if he makes friends with the worldly people, maybe they'll take him in and help him out because he's about to lose his job. So he won't be a guy begging in the street. They'll be like, you know, you gave me 50% off. Man, you saved me 20%. I'm going to do something for you. Like, you know, you rub my back, I rub your back type of way. That's what he's doing. He's being a con man is what he's doing. He's not so concerned about his master. He's concerned about himself and his own well-being and his own livelihood, his own life. This is what he has his focus on. And this is the perfect focus that Jesus is saying is the same as the Pharisees who were in it for themselves. They were in it for themselves, their own livelihood, their own, their own, uh, their own life, their own, uh, I don't know how you want to say it, but their own... Their own existence is what they were concerned about. Their number one was their existence. It wasn't God. Truly, as a Christian, our number one should be God, even over our own existence, even over our own, our own livelihood, our own selves. God is supposed to be above that, 100%. It's not supposed to be us first, God second. I mean, it's like continually in the Bible over and over and over again, God first, not second. And the example that Jesus is giving here is that these guys are in it for themselves, and yet at the same time, how easy it is for us to relate to this, to think, man, I do the same thing. What a smart fella. Golly, he's making a way for himself. But it just shows that sinful nature that's so hard on every single one of us that is within all of us. Here. And his master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly 
For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. So, you know, they think about this, uh, this you know, he's, he's pointing out that these guys that are acting so shrewd, you know, they're so concerned, they're working things so hard about, about the lost world, the secular world, the world away from God, or how much of the sons of light really work toward God and do the things that they ought to do, to follow God, to be obedient, to listen to his law, to put him first. And yet we see how the worldly folks do it, man, they're in both feet. They're not in just one foot, they're in both feet and they're trying to do well for themselves. They're, they're rich and they're making more and then their picture in their eyes, people who are like them are the ones who are successful. Those are the people who are doing well in life. And look at what Jesus called them, okay? Jesus is telling the story and what does Jesus call the steward? unrighteous so we know this isn't some type of a story that jesus is telling us to be like this guy right here he's an unrighteous steward he's a bad guy he's not a good guy and there is a legitimate moral difference between saying i applaud the clever steward because he acted dishonestly and saying i applaud the dishonest steward steward because he acted cleverly okay so this is what the master is doing he's like man this guy's a clever guy he was probably a shady fellow himself so to him, praise God, this guy was pretty shady himself. And man, am I impressed with his shadiness. He probably kept him on, gave him some more shady stuff to accomplish, get him more deeper and deeper into the hole of, uh, of darkness there. The master was saying the latter, not the former. And this is the key to understanding the parable. Jesus was not coming out in favor of fraud or telling us that it's right to cheat people. He was not saying that dishonesty, dishonesty is the best policy. Instead, he was giving an example of how clever worldly people can be when they act in their own best interest and think about that think about how clever the world is think about how clever the lost world is think about how clever all these propaganda things are that we get thrown at us all the time through the media and everything else how clever they are when they're looking at their own best interest and then look at christianity are we using the same cleverness are we using the brains that god gave us are we using all of the mental function and all of the all of the the clever abilities that we could use toward god often not you know but we can see it around us and right likely we're more familiar with the worldly ways of being clever like this in survival than we are god's ways unfortunately we should constantly be trying to get more clever in god how do we do that we get to know our word better we get to follow the spirit better our conscience better we do things that are right and not wrong. We don't go down the gray area. We stay to the, to the right area. These are things that are so important right here. And we see that what Jesus said, he calls them an unrighteous steward. And like, look how good they are to their own kind, you know, that are, that are, that are bad. You know, they're doing fraud. Really, it's total fraud. It'd be like, just like thinking about somebody working for Visa and Visa wasn't making a deal, but some person was making it, and they're just like signing off. It'd be like, here, sign here quickly, because later there might be an audit, and man, you're gonna get in big trouble. You'll still owe all that, plus some fines or something, and I might go to jail, but I'm gonna take out of here with this money, and I'm gonna be okay. That, that's where the uh, picture here is coming from. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves from the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will take you into the eternal dwellings. Okay, so this is the key verse right here that puts it together. It says, it says, to, it says here, it says that, that you're going to fail, and, the, and like the, all the worldly wealth, no matter what, what will it do? It will fail. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be successful. In other words, use your worldly wealth to make everlasting friends. Okay, and I got some examples here about how you can do this and pictures of this. But an analogy between the way the manager prepared for his unemployment and the way we ought to prepare for eternity. We should be having this kind of a desperate struggle toward God, not toward our, our, our livelihood, toward our existence right here on this earth at this time. And it's, it's, not, it's not if, but when you feel, fail, because we're all gonna fail eventually. Time's running on our life. None of us are gonna live forever. We're all gonna die. It's gonna be it. We talked about this morning in the one verse of evangelism with death. One day it'll be no more. It'll be gone. You know, game over. Nobody wins in the end. Nobody. Every single person dies in the end, no matter how clever, no matter how rich you were, no matter how much money you had. And uh, think about this. To take you into eternal dwellings is what you should be doing 
he was trying to go into some type of an earthly dwelling, the guy in this story. He was trying to make a deal so maybe if he had no place to live and he lost his job, one of those guys that he gave 50% off would say, hey, you could stay with me. All right, that's what he was doing. He was working out an earthly way. We should be thinking about our eternity, our eternity to be with God. And like I said, at the same time, we have to be careful not to get legalistic and say, well, if we don't work hard enough, we're not going to make it into heaven. No, that's not what we're saying here. But what we are saying here is that God's law is precious and it is to be kept and it is to be obeyed. And we should be doing everything we can toward God and loving God and following Him. And, and even at the end of all that, you'll find that you still fall short. But definitely that's where our goal in life should be. That's where we should strive and go toward. Not be just all caught up with the earthly dwellings in this life right here. And truly, the word for wealth in the King James Version is mammon, M-A-M-M-O-N. That means mammon. And that means everything you have in this life, mammon. That's what it means. And you can't have mammon and God at the same time. You can't hold on to everything you have in this life in one hand is so precious and hold it in the same way that you hold God. Think about that picture I showed you in the beginning. A man with money and a man with the Bible. Holding it right there at the same time on the same level. It's not like that. The right picture should be like, okay, the money's on the table. I'll manage the money that God gives me in this life. But God is my all. He is my everything. It's not the money that is my everything. It's not the wealth of this world. It's not anything in this life that manages me. That I hold a higher priority than my first priority is Jesus Christ and nothing is second to that. You know, it's him and him alone. The rest of the stuff is how I'm managing that. And I have what looks like a boring slide, but it may be a help understand. And I've got a lot of words in here, okay? I'm going to read top first. Maybe the friends Jesus has in mind are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because he says make friends for eternal dwellings, right? But more likely, they are fellow human beings we have befriended by giving help in a time of need. We will see them when we get to heaven, the victims of a natural disaster whom we help by sending emergency relief, members of distant tribes who heard the gospel through a missionary we supported, or a Bible translation that we funded, sex addicts and drug addicts who were saved through a ministry that we helped to start, people across the country who came to Christ through a radio broadcast we financed, people who were converted in the church where we tithe. You know, that's more like where it is with the monies that we give. And these are the kind of things that will be special. Imagine if you get to heaven, when you get to heaven, and in heaven somebody says, you know what, thank God that you did what you did because if that church didn't exist, if that ministry didn't exist, I don't know how I ever would have come to the faith right there. I know it came by faith through Jesus Christ, but the means that he used was you and what your money supported and what you put yourself into, okay? And there's a lot of stuff out there. None of this stuff is free, okay? You know, I'm not a big guy talking about money, but I tell you, nothing is free, okay? We do the best we can to make things as cheap as possible, or we look for deals, different things, but life costs a lot of money, and ministry costs a lot of money. And I'm not one of the type of people that talk about money all the time. I surely don't do that. In my opinion, a lot of ministries do that. Why? Because they've got themselves so large that more than what they really should be, and they desperately need to have more because there's not enough to pay the bills. And then they lopside things, and they talk more about money than they do about the Bible. But there are passages in the Bible like this one that talk about money, so we talk about money too when we hit these kind of passages, okay? And it is important for us to see it truly the way I feel at the end of the day is why does God want us to give money? Why does did God have a tie? Why are all these things like this? It's so that the money doesn't own us. Because if you don't do those things, if you don't give anything, money is going to own you all the way. You're going to be owned by the money. You're going to be owned by your wealth. It'll be more important to you every step of the way than God. And that's a bad thing to be right there. And that's not a place to be. And by us giving some of the money that God gives us, he gives us all the money. Everything we have comes from him anyways. It helps to keep us from being in that bondage where we can't get free of it because we are so caught up that our money is more important than anything. And I tell you, I've been in this struggle myself, and it's not an easy struggle to be in. But as I look back, every time I gave any money to church or anything I ever gave to or to ministries, I never regret money like that. That's money that's well spent, very well spent. I might regret money 
Did I spend on something and I found out I could have got a lot better deal or that ended up being a waste of my time where I was like, golly, how much did I waste money like this? But I never regret money spent toward the Lord. And truly, this is probably where this is going at with this verse about make friends for your eternal dwellings. Think about people that you'll see on the other side one day and they'll be like, because of what you sacrificed, look at what God did for me with those means in that type of way right there. And it's a beautiful type of picture. This advice is contrary to every impulse of a consumer culture. Let me tell you, we live in a consumer culture. Every one of us is deep in this consumer culture. We, all know, we wouldn't know what to do if we weren't in a consumer culture. Man. That's how bad it is. When people know they're running out of time, they usually spend more on themselves, not less. They're like the precocious child in a well-known comic strip. Okay, I know you guys have all seen this, at least I have. Calvin and Hobbes, okay? As Calvin and his friend Hobbes contemplate a snowman they've made, Hobbes comments, this snowman doesn't look very happy. He's not, Calvin says. He knows it's just a matter of time before he melts. The sun ignores his existence. He feels his existence is meaningless. Hobbes responds by asking if existence is really as meaningless <coughs> as the snowman thinks it is. Nope, Calvin replies, he's about to buy a big screen TV. This is the way many people operate. They are living for the moment, not for eternity. And when from time to time they sense the meaningless of their existence, they just go out and buy something to make themselves feel better. I tell you, this is so true. I can tell you the difference of this between the city of Brunswick and the city of Strongsville. My whole life, I've been part of the village of Strongsville. If you think of like a picture that I'm trying to paint, I'm a Strongsville villager. I have my whole life. Went away 20 years in the army, came back. I'm a Strongsville villager. There may be villains and such in my town, I know there are, but there are some people that I like and good folks too, it's just where I'm from. But in Strongsville, there's a lot of people with a lot of money a lot of times, it's a very expensive place. In Brunswick, Brunswick isn't as quite as expensive. And I tell you, you can tell the difference between a Brunswick person and a Strongsville person almost right away. A Brunswick person is more heart to heart, is more person to person with you. It's a person that you can connect with person you can shoot the breeze with, a person that you can hang out with, okay? A strong so person, some of them might be so uptight, you can never really get down to that level of comfortableness with them, okay? Where you're just honestly talking, they're like, oh, you know, what do you do? I make all this money. What do you do? I make all this money. Oh, okay, we all make all this money. Type of idea like this. This is how I see it. Now, how I really see it, that's played out to prove my point, is amount of churches. In Brunswick, there are well over 30 churches in this little town right here, okay? It's got like 35,000 people. In Strongsville, I think there's 45,000 people, and it has like six or seven churches, okay? Way less than the amount of churches right there. In Brunswick, if you walk around and talk to people, do some door-to-door, -door, about every single person belongs to a church. I don't know if they go to a church. In Strongsville, you walk around and talk to people, they don't even want to tell you if they go to a church, if they even belong to one of those churches. There's a coldness about it. In Brunswick, when I started looking to plant this church, I checked for Strongsville, and every Southern Baptist church that was ever planted in Strongsville failed. Every single one of them. None of them over all these years has been able to hold up. In Brunswick, there was a guy before me, I don't know the fellow, maybe some of you guys know the fellow, but there was another Southern Baptist here, and here I am again. Now actually there's two Southern Baptist churches, there's another one over there down the road. But don't go there, you guys are my flock, okay? <laughs> don't go over there, alright? They're good folks too, but we got two, okay? But that's what I'm saying, Brunswick folks have churches, they, it's not so much, it's a difference, it's a difference in an idea of the consumer culture, and of course, Brunswick folks are still sinners, we're all still sinners, but you can tell the different degree of how intense some folks that live in cities that, that, that make bigger, higher salaries. In fact, I remember seeing, I think, the Strongsville folks' average salary was six figures. The Brunswick folks' average salary was like thirty or 40000 a year. It was a drastic difference with this between Brunswick and Strongsville. And these are like these big type pictures that you can get, you can scan. I can get them still for free and get it if you want to find out some more interesting stuff. All I got to do is ask these guys, they run these numbers, and they tell me. And it's like how you assess the area you're in. But here, here we see this. Well, my whole point in talking so long about all this, I really went on a tangent here. I'm sorry about that. But what I, well, my whole point about talking with all of this, okay, with the monies and with everything, 
is that, uh, that, that we, in Strongsville, how do people find their peace? They find their peace by going and buying something else new, by buying some other big thing. They buy something and they're like, you know what? I'm not happy, but I'll take some more money. I'll make some more money. I'll buy some more stuff. That's the attitude. And that's, that, that's the one core I was trying to get to with that whole tangent. I just went on for five minutes, okay? Is when you have a lot of money, sometimes the way you make yourself happy is you just go buy something else, okay? Buy a little something more, something a little more comfort for your life. Just like the snowman. Oh, he's going to get a big screen TV even though he's about to melt and the sun's coming out, okay? And this is, this is what I see. Now, when people don't have as much money, where do they turn? They tend to turn toward God. And that's a beautiful thing. That's why it's also so dangerous to have a lot of money. Because let me tell you, it's our sinful nature. It pulls us like a magnet towards stuff rather than God for seeking comfort, for seeking peace, for seeking joy. And we can see this very well in the picture, okay, that, that Jesus paints in this passage as well, too. So we move on. It says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. So here's something. If, if somebody you're watching, uh, here's an example. I, I read this example is, some guy was a pastor of a church and he had some pastoral interns and stuff, and he found out he found out that somebody in the church was in great need. Like, I mean, they weren't like somebody who was like a drug addict lying to you and stuff, just wanting to take. They were a person with genuine need and hurt. And he found out about this, and he thought, how is the needs been being met? And he found out this pastoral intern, who was like not a big fellow, was taking care of this person on his own, with nobody else even telling him about it. And he knew right then, he knew, you know what? I can trust that guy with much greater things. Because look what he does on his own. Look how he's managing himself. Look how he's uh, look how he's done this on his own. Where if somebody is, say, say, uh, say somebody there, and they do a bunch of shady stuff, and you can't trust them, and you think they're trying to stab you in the back or different things, then you're like, oh, the heck if I'm going to give them some more power, because all of a sudden that will be terrible. Okay? So these are the kind of pictures that we see in this verse right here. Those who are faithful in little, okay, he who is faithful in very little thing is also, is, he thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in the little things, unrighteous also in much. So those little things count. And where you're faithful in a little thing, you know what? You'll probably be faithful in a big thing. And here's a picture. I always think army stuff because I was in the army so long it wired me quite a bit in my mind. Okay, I'm 50 and 20 years of my life I was an army man, and in the army, in the army you have a person if they're able to do a, a little job the right way, you think all right that's good. But if they can't even get the little job done, you sure as heck don't want to put them in a big job or even a better picture. If you're training for combat and a guy is sleeping when he should be pulling security. You know what's going to happen, and you say, why are you sleeping? Well, it's just training. It's just training. Well, I guarantee you, I've seen it in my own eyes, those same guys are sleeping when it's real deal combat, and somebody's life's at stake. They just go to sleep because that's where they're at. They're, they're, not, they're not faithful in little things, and they sure aren't faithful in big things right there. It really does play out. You know, they say you train as you fight, and if you, don't, and if you see a guy training like to some low par standard that he just doesn't care and has a bad attitude, He's sure not going to have a good attitude when it, the game's on and it's the big show right there. It won't be like that. So this is what this verse is showing. Is It's showing that, that God is this how God sees us. Those who are faithful in little things can also be faithful in much. God can give you more to be faithful with. God can give you more to, uh, to, to, to be. It's not talking about like money. I'm no prosperity preacher. It doesn't mean you're going to get a whole lot more money if you're faithful <coughs> with a little money. But I'm talking about life. I'm talking about moving through life. I, I think about it like the way I tell people with the way an officer track or the way an enlisted track would be. An enlisted track in the Army is like this. It's like a 45-degree angle. You don't have a choice. You have to grow, okay? But you're growing like this. An officer track, when you throw a guy straight out of college in charge of 40 guys in a platoon and he's wet behind the ears and knows nothing, his track's like this. He doesn't, he's got to be the top man even though he knew nothing at all hardly. And it's a hard track to make. But you know what? Those who make that track, they have a much greater influence. They have a much greater uh, leadership opportunities. They have so much more 
Then this fellow who can only get so much because he's only so much, you can't be trusted with so much. He's like this slower track right here. And this is the way you think about it with God. With God, I want to be a general officer, okay? I want to be high in the army of God, okay? And not so somebody can recognize me as a general for the experience, for the experience and life experience of going through life and living a godly way that God gives me to live, to be able to share the gospel, to be in places of ministry, to be able to be places where, where God is glorified. I want to be in a big place with that. I don't want to be in a place where I'm so unfaithful with every so little that I have that I'm still on this like baby track that I never get off of. Think about like uh, the milk of the word. You know, when Hebrews talks about you guys are still just drinking from the milk of the word, you can have nothing more than the milk. You're still on the basic of basics because you can't go above the basic of basics. Well, I'll tell you, one way to go above the basic of basics is to trust God. Put him as your number one. Put him as first over all things. And I wrote on here, this is the second principle for life of money. Be faithful with what you have so that you can receive something even better, okay? And I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about all kinds of stuff with life, okay? Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? You know, like I said, who's going to trust you? If you can't do something right with a little thing, how can you be trusted with a big thing? Nowhere is faithfulness more important than the use we make of our material possessions because what we do with our money always reveals what is really in our hearts, okay? If you think about you put your treasure where your heart is, okay? If you have, like, no money in any type of ministry whatsoever, you got to think, well, my heart's not really there. You know, my heart's not really there. But if we invest, wherever we invest ourselves, our money, our time, who we are, that's where we really are. That's who we really are. And we have to, uh, we have to think about this. It really, really does play out. And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Okay, so if you can't be faithful in, like if the master steward guy can't trust this guy to do his job, how would he give him his own stuff to go trust himself with? Okay, and we are only stewards. We are never masters. Remember this. We are never God. We never co-create okay that's a word i heard this week and i was pretty upset with not some type of devotional i looked at there's not one that i'd recommend and uh the word was co-create we don't co-create anything god creates everything okay we follow god we are always going to be stewards of god we're never on the same level of god everything belongs to god a hundred percent of the way no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Or if King James, you can't serve God and mammon. And I like that mammon, because it kind of encircles more than what just the idea of wealth is. It encircles of everything you have materialistic in this life. A principle for your money in your life, do not make money your master, but bring yourself and everything you have under the mastery of Jesus Christ. We love God too much to be satisfied with the world, but we love our money too much to find our true joy in God. That's a terrible place to be, isn't it? You love God so much that you can't find satisfaction in this world, but you love your money so much you can't find true joy in God. That's really the dilemma that we find ourselves in as, as human beings that are tainted with sin. Okay, We get stuck and we know, you know what, I know I can't be satisfied without God, but yet... I can't really have fullness of God because I love my money too much in this world. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. So think about this. These Pharisees were just like that. What does it say? They were lovers of money. Jesus said they were lovers of money. It's not me saying they were lovers of money. The scripture says the Pharisees were lovers of money. And they just heard this story, so they shook them up bad. They were busy doing many things for God. But in their heart of hearts, they loved money more than they ever loved God. As a result, they disagreed with most of the things Jesus said about money. Material prosperity is not a status sign of the spiritual success, like I told you before. People scoff at things they find threatening. I see this all the time, even with straight Bible verses. If you tell someone a Bible verse like this who's a lover of money, and they scoff and they're angry, but yet they say they believe God and they believe the Bible, you got to say, well, what do you do with that verse? What do you do with this verse? You throw it away? It's a verse that's in the Bible. It's right there. And we have to look at this and we have to negotiate. Think of the Pharisees. They didn't care what Jesus was saying. Jesus could have quoted all Old Testament too. The same stuff says throughout there too. 
and yet they didn't care. They got angry because that was their sin, and they blocked it off immediately rather than being like, oh God, help me with this. Help me with this dilemma. Help me with this strong bondage of sin that I have on me that I love my money so much more than I love you. And that's what they should have been at, but they weren't. You know, their heart, their heart was after money, and it wasn't after God. God was secondary, and God needs to be primary in our life. As he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. I know it's KJV, but another denomination means it's an abomination in the sight of God. And we're in the month of abomination right now. We are practicing abomination in the month of June in our culture, okay? They call it Pride Month. We call it Abomination Month in that sense. Best picture? I saw a picture I sent to a couple people. I sent to you if you tell me afterwards. It's a picture of Satan falling from heaven. The first Pride Month that ever happened. That's what happened. Satan was kicked out of the kingdom of heaven when he had pride. And he said, I will be like the Most High God. What happened? The devil was thrown from heaven when that happened. So you talk about a sinful practice. To call a great sin pride is something wonderful to celebrate. That's the most evil thing right there. Okay, And it's upon us in our culture. And we see this, how people try to justify themselves in the sight of men. But you know, God knows what's going on. And in God's eyes... Sin is detestable. It's an abomination before him. And we don't want that to be in our lives, okay? I, I can read this. The Pharisees' love of money was connected to an even deeper spiritual problem, namely their inclination to justify themselves rather than trusting God to justify them through Jesus Christ. This is what we're always trying to do, conceal our sin by making ourselves look better than what we really are. We are all like this until we learn the grace of God. What a shocking thing to say that what sinful people praise actually deserves divine damnation. Okay? That's, that's, that's what the Pharisees deserved. Divine damnation. They deserved hell is what they said. Okay? That's what they deserved. And here, we, we need to be careful that we don't conceal our sin to try to make ourselves look better than somebody else. You know, we need to be humble. Every day... We got to make sure we take that humble pie. Every day I take my vitamins and I take a couple other pills now that I'm 50. Two pills I have to take. <laughs> and, and then some other ones that are good ideas to take. And when I take them, I also need to try to think about I need to also eat a piece of humble pie this morning. Because if I don't eat this, I'm going to get myself thinking more than what I am. I'm going to get going on this sinful type of way in life. And I have to be humble okay humble means i accept that i'm a sinner i accept that i'm wrong i accept that i'm messed up i accept that i need more light from god i need his forgiveness that i'm in desperate need of the grace of god these pharisees were all self-righteous they thought they were somebody special they thought they were all good they thought i'm not like that guy over there that's who they thought and they and jesus hit him with their money which was about the tightest spot for them to be hit, because I'm sure every one of them was trying to make more money than the other one and trying to look like they were a little bit more than the other guy. They had their levels of society depending on how much money that they had. And it's the same way still today. And, and this is the way we are until we learn about the grace of God. Because you could try to do this in the right way. You could try to do all the right things. You can give money all that you want to every place you think about and still be wrong with God because you're trying to do it by works and not realizing that it's purely by the grace of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is proclaimed and everyone is forcing his way into it. And this means that there is good news for all the money-loving sinners whose transgressions are an abomination to God. We do not have to be saved by fulfilling a law that we cannot keep but simply by trusting the grace that Jesus has for us in the gospel. This is how we're justified, by true faith in Jesus Christ. A man will be justified by faith, said Calvin, when he lays hold of the righteousness of Christ and appears in the sight of God not as a sinner but as righteous. We should be eager, like, like the woman in the crowd. Think about the woman in the crowd with a bleeding issue for, what, like 12 years or something, and how she persistently made her way to Jesus. Or think about the... The fellows that were the friends of the crippled guy who took apart the roof in the building where Jesus was talking and lowered him down. 
persistence, pressing into the kingdom of God, and they and they and they were going to force their way toward it. It was like that that drive, that drive that is missing so much of so many Christians today. They're not forcing their way into the kingdom of God. I want more Jesus. How do I get more Jesus in my life? How am I become a better Christian? Rather than how do I meet the minimum standard? Where is the minimum standard? You know, when I was in the army, I hated that. When I was uh, I was a ranger in special forces, but when I worked ROTC, I taught all these young college kids that were going to be officers, okay? And they don't start off good, they have to be trained good, okay? And when I was training them, they were always like, what's the minimum amount of push-ups I have to do? What's the minimum amount of sit-ups? I'm thinking, who asks minimum? My whole army career, everybody said, what's the maximum? How do I max this test? Not how do I barely pass this test? And unfortunately, with so many Christians today, we have people who are trying to say, what is the minimum I need to do to make sure I get to heaven, to make sure that, that I'm a Christian right there? We should be looking at what, what can I do to max this? I want to push my way in. And yet at the end of the day, it's all by grace. No matter how hard you tried, no matter whatever you did, it's all the grace of God. And that's so hard for some people to understand because they're so caught up in this workspace righteousness. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one stroke of a letter of the law to fail, Jesus said. So, so that's what it says. It's not like saying we're getting rid of the law, okay? The law is the law, okay? Grace is grace. There are two different things right there, okay? The law is beautiful. The law is God's law. But none of us can be saved except only by His grace. And here's a Bible verse that Jesus said. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass on the law until all is accomplished. Which means not the cross of a T or not the jot, dot of an I. It's all still there. God's law. Whole Old Testament. It's all still there. Okay? And there, Jesus hits them with probably one of the hardest laws for these guys, because they were a bunch of uh, womanizing type fellows, these Pharisees. They constantly were getting rid of one <coughs> wife and going to another wife. And Jesus, man, he's just beating the daylights out of them. You think about this. Think about what they say, uh, uh, sticks, and, sticks and stones, they'll break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And how we know that that's not really true at all, that the words hurt far worse sometimes than the sticks and bones do. Jesus is crushing them with the words right now. He's not just crushing them with sticks and bones. He's crushing them with words. He hit them because they were lovers of money. He hit them where they're divorcing their wives and things and just changing the rules around to try to fit themselves right there. Jesus is laying these guys down to waste. And is he doing it because he hates them? No. He's doing it because he loves them. Because in order to see someone come to Christ, they've got to know about their sin. They have to know they're a sinner. They have to know they're not worthy. It's not about this self-esteem and all this stuff the way our culture tries to teach us and says that's what the kid needs. No, the kid needs to know that he is a rotten sinner. And we need a, a God who, who we find identity in, who he gives us grace. He gives us love. Our worthiness, our identity, our value is found in Jesus Christ, not in ourselves. And this is something that is so upside down in our worldly world where the worldly world would think man that unrighteous steward he was the man he's the hero that's what seems so strange why would jesus tell a story that really shows how hero like a bad guy is in the in the dark world well he's doing it because he's showing how empty that is because that guy will never get eternal life that guy is no different than where the pharisees were okay that thought they were something and really they weren't anything so he says, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. Why did Jesus use this example of the law? Probably because this was one of the very laws that the Pharisees were failing to keep. In Mark 7, 9, it says they were good at setting aside the law of God to keep their traditions. Think about that. They like to set along the law of God, keep their traditions. I see this constantly. I think... If you're going to judge a church and decide which church do I go to, what kind of, what, how do I want to practice my faith? I had a guy ask me yesterday, he said, he said, why do you like Reformed theology so much? And I said, because, I want to take the wrong book, I'm going to show you the right book. I said, because it holds the Bible way up here. Because it's all about scripture. It's not about traditions. It's not about ideologies. It's not about theologies even, like a theological picture right here it's about the scripture itself and the word of god and that's where it's at and this is why i like reform theology so much okay 
because it's not about traditions and all these other things. And constantly, I'm reforming more. I'm learning more. I'm growing more. And I want to know, where is that in the scripture? I can listen to your ideas all day long about traditions or your ideas or your theology or your opinions. And that stuff's important. I, I enjoy listening to where people come to and what's in their minds and different things. But until you show me scripture, until I can tie it in with the scripture, it doesn't have the same type of meaning to me whatsoever as what the Bible has. Okay, It may sound nice, it may sound good, but here the Pharisees had made themselves a false religion. And many today have made themselves false religions. They try to say something's okay that's not okay. I imagine that Jesus was talking today in our time. I bet there would be a, a verse here about homosexuality. And talking about how sinful that is. Because our culture has said it's so wonderful and so great. Let's have a whole month to celebrate this stuff. And act like this is the most wonderful stuff ever. It's the most horrible stuff ever right there. It's, it's just the same picture as Satan being thrown down from the kingdom of God because of his pride. Pride isn't something that we get gleeful about. It says before pride comes the fall is what the Bible says. We have to be careful that we don't let this stuff stain us. But Jesus hit these guys right where their sin was the worst probably. Because they were a divorcing type of community, those Pharisees. Alright, I'm almost done. I know. I'm getting myself tired out up here. I'm not getting tired out down there. Alright. The only investment we can make that will give us the joy of everlasting friendship is an, effort, is an investment in the kingdom of God. So we want to have everlasting friendship with other folks and stuff. Invest in the kingdom of God. And not just with money, with time, with yourself, with your heart, with your whole being. Augustine, great theologian back in the year 400, he said, Why did the Lord Jesus Christ present this parable to us? He surely did not approve of that cheat of a servant who cheated his master, stole from him, and did not make it up from his own pocket. Why did the Lord set this before us? It's not because that servant cheated, but because he exercised foresight for the future. He was ensuring for a life that was going, that was, he was ensuring himself for a life that was going to end. Then Augustine pressed his point home with a practical question. Would you not ensure for yourself an eternal life? You know, think about this. What is more important? And I tell you, so many people, they just fall back on, give me a bigger screen TV. Give me another thing. That's, a, give me a little comfort. It doesn't give them comfort. They're still unhappy folks. Now this looks like a whole lot of stuff right here. These are some hard questions. Hard questions that's going to hit every one of us if you listen to them and you're be like, oh me, oh me, help me Jesus. We've got to say, thank God, grace. Thank God for grace because this is going to hit every one of us, these questions. But even to this day, many people are like the Pharisees. They continue to misuse the law of God, treating it as a way of salvation. They imagine there's something they can do to justify themselves before God and men. This is even true in the evangelical church, where nearly 90% of people in one opinion poll agreed that in salvation, God helps those who help themselves. That's a horrible saying. If you ever hear that saying, you should be agitated by it. God does not help those who help themselves. You want to talk about workspace salvation's theme verse? That's it right there, okay? God helps those who help themselves. That is no Bible verse whatsoever. That's a made-up ideology. God's grace helps us. It's by His grace and His mercy. Should we do everything we can? Absolutely. But you know what? Unless God does something, nothing is going to come of that. 100% nothing toward God. It's all God. So here are some things that are going to hit us right here. Hit me too when I read it. On these questions. Which master are you serving? Is Jesus Christ the master of your heart or are you still slaving away from money? Here are some warning signs that we are more in love with money than we are with God. When we're anxious about our finances, not trusting God to provide for our needs today and tomorrow. We are in love with money and its power to make us feel more secure. So we think, okay, our money is how we'll feel safe and secure. We shouldn't be so anxious. We should, be, we should take care. We should do the best we can. But then we leave it in God's hand and trust that God will provide. Okay? Best picture of this is people with kids. I tell people who have a lot of kids that sometimes look scared. I'm like, don't you worry. God will provide for those children. That's a beautiful thing to have more kids and have a big family. When our lives are so full of work that we have to say no to Christian service, we're in love with money and have given it mastery over our schedule. You know, there's some people who purposely take jobs on Sundays. I can see it if you don't have any money and you've got to do what you've got to do and you've got to, you've got to go, then you've got to do what you have to do. Maybe you have to work on a Sunday. 
But some people will be like, I can have even more if I work on a Sunday. Or that, that would please me more to work on Sunday and have Friday off, you know, something like this. When we find our thoughts returning again and again to something we are hoping to buy, and we're in love with money and its power to get us what we think we want. So if your whole life is just thinking about the next thing you're going to buy, the next big money thing that you have, there's a problem, okay? If that's where you're getting your joy of the next money thing that's coming around or the next worldly type of wealth thing going around, there's a problem. We should be getting daily joy in Jesus Christ, not stuff, okay? In the end, stuff all goes away. We make employment decisions that are spiritually unwise for ourselves and our families. We're in love with money and our plans for getting more of it. Say you already have enough money, but you're, you're, you're doing way too much for more money. I used to like to teach CCW, and I liked that. I made a little money from it, but there came a time that it just wouldn't work no more. I had to say, okay, no more CCW from me. Okay? I still have people call me for it, and I used to like it, but I just I have to, I have to balance things the right way, okay? And it's not the money thing. All right, uh, here it is right here. When we spend more time complaining about what we do not have than when rejoicing what we do have, we're in love with money and depend on our possessions rather than on God to give us contentment and joy. So we have to think about this. If we're all the time complaining about what we don't have and never thanking God for what we do have, there's an issue. Every one of us in this room, I know us in this room, we've got something to praise God about. Every single one of us. There's not a one of us in this room that doesn't have something we can praise God about. When it seems difficult or even impossible to give up something we want in order to give a full biblical tithe or to make a sacrificial gift to Christian work, we're more in love with money than we are with the gospel and what it can do to change the world. You know, like if you think, you know what, I can take that money instead of giving it to the church, I can invest it for myself, and I can do pretty good. That's not a good thing right there, okay? We owe God. We should be giving money to God. It's God's money in the first place. Think about this in the end of God would ever show us and be like, okay, let's look at how all the dollar bills you had in your life. How much did you give toward the ministry? Oh, 0.01% of your life you gave to the ministry. I see how valuable this was to you in your life, you know? I was just an example. But here, when it seems when it seems difficult, all right, with the presence of absence of these warning signs will indicate whether God is our strongest affection or whether we need to confess that we have the kind of love affair with money that can destroy our souls, all right? So how do you get past all this stuff? Because I'm sure in this passage, if it didn't hit you, I don't know, but it hits me all over the place in this passage right there myself. What do we do with this? We pray to God and we say, God, help me. Have mercy on me. Help me to be more towards you. Help me to make you the number one in my life. And help me to stop putting you as number two. And if you remember the first picture, you got money in one hand and the Bible in the other. Say, God, help me to lay that money down. And God, provide for me, and I trust you that you'll make a way for the money with me and help me to keep you first in my life. And I'll tell you what, you'll have more joy than somebody with a giant six-figure salary because you've got Jesus Christ. And I've seen it myself, back to the Strongsville, Brunswick dimension from my little opinion point of view. I see a lot more happy people over here than I do over there. Even though they may have a lot more money, I see happier people over here because a lot of them have the joy of the Lord because they've given up on that rat race of chasing after the money that when you die, you die and it's gone. It doesn't go with you right there. And they've come to the point that they're finding their joy in the Lord Jesus Christ and that's a joy that is everlasting. And when you make investments into the kingdom of God, they are eternal investments that go forever. And I would love one day to be in heaven and have somebody say, you know what, you were involved in that ministry, that's the ministry that I came to know the Lord in right there. I'd be like, praise God, I didn't even know it. Don't give me the credit for it. But thank God that I did something good right there, okay? And this is the type of places where we should be, and this is where we can learn from this passage here. And we make, need to make sure that we're not like the Pharisees. None of us should be like, I'm a proud Pharisee. That would be a horrible thing to be. That's just as bad as being a Pride June Month type of guy right there, okay? A proud sinner. That's what that is, a proud sinner. We don't want to be a proud sinner. We want to be a humble believer. And with this, I'm going to close, and we're going to make some prayer requests. Somebody have a prayer request.